We just got the newest inflation data and half of Wall Street is losing their minds, but if you've been reading market briefs, you're probably not that surprised. On April 10th, it was reported that between March 2023 and March 2024, inflation rose to 3.5%. But the real reason why this inflation number is so significant is because this is the first month of year-over-year -year acceleration in U.S. grocery prices since August 2022. If you remember, the Federal Reserve Bank doesn't like to look at this headline inflation. They like to look at what's called core inflation, which is where you take this headline inflation and then you strip out what's called the volatile numbers, including things like energy and food. Well, core inflation rose 3.8% over the last year. So now that inflation has come in hotter than expected, the real question you want to ask is what does this mean? And there are four things that I want to go over in this video. Number one is people are less certain now about the Federal Reserve Bank cutting interest rates. Number two is that mortgage rates in the housing market might stay higher for longer. Number three is that auto loan rates might stay higher for longer, which can also impact the auto industry. And number four is that these higher interest rates can also play an impact on the economy. So what I want to do in this video is I'm going to go over these four things. I'm going to talk about what does this mean with interest rates? What does this mean for the housing market? What does this mean for the car market? And what does this mean for the general economy? And let me start by talking about number one. What does this inflation data mean in terms of interest rates? Now, of course, if you have not subscribed to Market Briefs yet. Market Briefs is my free financial newsletter where every day my team is working to break down what's happening in things like the economy, the housing market, the stock market, the crypto market, and the global economy into a fun, really, and easy to read newsletter. You can read Market Briefs in less than five minutes every morning, and I promise you are going to love reading Market Briefs every morning. And if you're thinking, but just put it, how can you promise that? Well, if you don't love it, you can unsubscribe at any time because it's completely free. So if you haven't joined Market Briefs yet, I got the link for you down in the description below, where you can go to briefs.co slash market. That's briefs.co slash Market. Now, just like how it's impossible to predict what's going to happen in the economy tomorrow, nobody can predict what's going to happen with interest rates this year. I mean, remember when inflation was transitory? But what I think will serve you value is to understand now people's perceptions and how they've changed over what's going to happen with interest rates. Because if we go back in time to 2023, in mid-2023, the consensus was that we would see steep Federal Reserve Bank interest rate cuts coming in 2024 as inflation subsides. And this sentiment that we are going to see a lot of interest rate cuts in 2024 continued into the beginning part of 2024 when many people believed that we would see six interest rate cuts in 2024. Now to paint the full picture, the reason why so many people were optimistic about so many interest rate cuts in 2024 was because the Federal Reserve Bank essentially said that the inflation fight was over. Well, turns out it's not. It wasn't until a couple of months ago, between February and March 2024, that the tone on inflation started to change when we got an inflation report that was hotter than expected. After that inflation report, the consensus started to change. The consensus was that the Federal Reserve Bank will still cut interest rates in 2024, but they might wait until June 2024 to start cutting interest rates, and then maybe we'll see three to four interest rate cuts by the end of 2024. That brings us to today, mid-April 2024, where now the consensus is that we'll see probably two to three interest rate cuts by the end of 2024. Now remember, back in January 2024, it was that we'll see six interest rate cuts. Today, now it's maybe we'll see two to three cuts by the end of the year. So you can start to see how that trend has been changing on the projections of how aggressively the Federal Reserve Bank is going to cut interest rates, all because of how inflation has been coming down slower than expected. Now I'm going to save what the impacts of these higher interest rates are on the broader economy for the end of this video, but this brings me now to the housing market because of course the housing market has been on, let's call it choppy waters, because now not only do you have to pay higher prices to buy a home, but you have to pay higher interest rates to buy that same home. So if we stick with the assumption that interest rates are going to stay higher for longer, well, that means that people who want to buy a home might not be getting those 4% mortgage rates like a lot of people were predicting as soon as people were thinking. So if we stick with the assumption that interest rates are going to stay higher for longer, well, that might mean that if you want to buy a home, you might not be getting those 4% mortgage rates as soon as a lot of people were predicting. But the reason why this is so important is because, well, like I just said, it is more expensive to buy a home, not just because home prices are more expensive, but because more mortgage rates are more expensive. And that means that you either need to be able to make a bigger down payment to buy a home, or you have to earmark more of your monthly budget for housing costs. The reason why housing is such a big deal is because housing is a necessary cost. Every single person needs a place to live. And not just that, it is one of the biggest costs for pretty much every American. And so as you have this high inflation, that also means that well, your cost to live is also more expensive. And you might say, but just please, I own my home. So this inflation doesn't really affect me. It just means my home is more valuable, which is great, right? Well, yes, 
But don't forget that if your home is going up in value and you own your home, even if you own your home free and clear, you also have to pay property taxes on that home. And if your home is going up in value, which is a good thing, that also means you have to pay higher property taxes and higher insurance costs. No, I'm not saying it's a bad thing that your home is going up in value, but you have to understand that higher home prices impact people who own a home and impact people who want to buy a home. Not to mention that if you're thinking about renting a home, well, renting is also expensive. Now, a lot of people will tell you that renting is cheaper than it is to buy a home today, but in general, across the board, whether you wanna buy a home or rent a home, it is much more expensive to pay for your housing costs today than it was five years ago. And because of that, a lot more people are having to spend a bigger chunk of their budgets, a bigger chunk of their income, just to put a roof over their head, which means before you even think about eating, more of your money is gone. Before you think about investing, more of your money is gone, which is why a lot of people are struggling more and more with their money today than they were a few years ago. This brings me to the next part of this video, which is the second most expensive purchase for most Americans, which is your car. Now, most Americans are having some sort of financing on their car. I am not an advocate of you going out and financing your car. However, the reality is most Americans are financing the car. So I don't think you should finance your car, but let's talk about what's going on with the car payments and what's going on with the car market because this is the reality of what's happening in America today. If we have higher interest rates, that also means that if you're going out to finance your car, you might have to pay higher interest interest rates to finance the car. And that comes at an interesting time because, well, according to the Federal Reserve Bank, auto loan delinquencies are also at multi-year highs. We're seeing a 13-year high on auto loan delinquencies. Now you might be wondering, well, Jasprit, why are more and more people falling behind on their auto loans? Well, as car prices have gone up over the last number of years with the higher interest rates, that means more and more people have to pay more money to keep paying for their car. Now, unlike your home, people can do without a car. I mean, most people will tell you that my home is more important than my car, but of course you have some people that will say, well, I can sleep in my car and drive to work in it, but I can't do that with my home. But for the average person, your car is less important than your home. So when people start to run into financial issues, one of the first things they stop making the payments on is their car. Now, what we've also seen is that car payments have gone through the roof. We've seen a record number of Americans with a $1,000 a month car payment or more. And now here in 2024, we're also seeing a growing number of people that are getting a car with a $1,500 a month car payment alone. Now, this $1,500 a month car payment does not include your car insurance, does not include your maintenance, does not include your premium gas. Now, I have no issue with you going out and buying a car that you can comfortably afford. I don't care if you wanna buy a $300,000 car if you can afford it. But the problem that I have is when more and more Americans are making okay salaries and then they're dishing so much of their income. They're spending a huge chunk of their income just to pay for that BMW or just to pay for that Escalade because you think it looks cool. Now, here's the thing. That BMW and the Escalade or the Mercedes is dropping in value each and every year. Your car is a liability. And so if you wanna drive a nice car, fine. But the reason I don't want you to finance it is because now when you finance a car, you're financing something, which means you're paying interest on something that's losing value that has a limited time span. Because the car, after five or six years, isn't gonna have the same value that it does today. And you might also be looking for a new car in five or six years, because if you don't take good care of it, it might not be able to continue driving in five or six years. And so now when you're financing that car, you have to pay interest on something that's losing value that has a limited time span, which is why if you want to buy a car, fine, just make sure you can afford it, which is why I recommend you go out and buy a car with cash that we can buy something that you can afford. And sure, maybe you don't gotta buy a BMW, but for the same $8,000 down payment that you put on the BMW or the Mercedes, you can get yourself a nice used Toyota Corolla. And you might say, but that's pretty, I don't wanna drive around in a Toyota Corolla. Well, it's not permanent. You drive around in the Toyota Corolla for a little while, you save that five, six, seven, eight hundred dollars a month that you were given to BMW, you take the money, you put it into the markets, you work to build your savings, you work to pay off your credit card debt, you work to build your wealth, and now you got assets that can pay for whatever car you want. Which brings me to number four now, the impact of this higher inflation and the higher interest rates on the broader economy. Now, if you've been watching my videos for the last few years, you've probably heard me say that our economic system runs on spending. And the reason why is because when you have more money to spend, somebody else can make more money. When you walk into Chipotle and you open up your wallet and you're buying all the extra guac, Chipotle is making more money, they have more money to pay their employees, they have more money to open more stores, they have more money to hire more people, they have more money to invest back into the brand. But if you walk into Chipotle and you say, you know what? I got no money for you today because I got to spend more money in my car. I got to spend more money in my house and I don't have any money to eat out at Chipotle anymore. Well, that means Chipotle starts making less money. And if they're making less money, well, that means they don't have money to keep 
paying their employees, which means they might have to downsize, they might have to shut down their stores, they might have to lay off some people. Which is why it's so important to understand that our entire economic system depends on the American consumer's financial health. And what we've been seeing up until today is that Americans are still spending, which is why job growth has still been robust until today. Now, of course, some people are not happy with the job market because they can't find a job that is paying them enough or is not within their, their skill set. However, according to the data, the job market is still extremely strong and we still have historically low unemployment rates. And what that means now in the Federal Reserve Bank's eyes is more and more people still have an income, which means more and more people can also qualify for loans from the bank, which is more and more people have the ability to spend, not just from their income, but also based off of the credit that they can get from the bank, because we live in a credit-based system. You make money and you can spend money, not just based off of your income, but based off of how much debt you can qualify for. I'm not saying this is good, I'm telling you how it works. If you make $50,000 a year, you might be able to qualify for another $50,000 a year from the banks through credit cards, lines of credit, home equity lines of credit, and other forms of debt. So if you make $50,000 a year and you could only spend $50,000 a year, well, now your spending power is only $50,000 a year. But if you make $50,000 a year and you can qualify for an additional $50,000 a year from debt, now you have $100,000 worth of spending power. Why is that good? Because that increases how much consumption you can do today, that increases how much you can spend today, which helps to grow the economy today, which is good for the markets, good for the economy, but that also means that you could also hit a breaking point. Because if you spend too much money, you could also now hit that bust point where you've maxed out your credit cards, you can't qualify for more loans, and now you're really in that tight pinch where you can't keep spending any more money. And if we hit that point, which we haven't seen yet, then that's where you can start to see American consumers saying, you know what, I can't keep spending money because everything's so expensive and now I gotta cut back. I gotta stop eating out, I gotta give up my car, Yes, that means a repossession. I gotta stop paying my rent. And now you start to see defaults rise. You start to see more delinquencies rise. And now businesses start to make less money. Now, up until today, Americans have still been spending money like crazy. Yes, Americans are tapping out their credit cards. Yes, Americans are tapping into the 401ks. Yes, Americans are digging into their savings. But people are still able to spend, which shows, if you look at a snapshot today, that the economy is booming. But because of all these things happening, you have to imagine that eventually, we would hit a breaking point if people keep spending money that they don't have. And this is why the Federal Reserve Bank is kind of playing this, this tight rope balance where they've been doing this for a while now. They want to increase interest rates as a way to cool down demand. They want to increase interest rates to lower inflation. Again, they don't want negative inflation. They don't want the prices of things to fall. They want disinflation, which means they want the prices of things to rise just not as fast as they were before. The Federal Reserve Bank has an inflation target of 2%. Right now, we're 3 to 4% inflation, according to the data. The average person is probably feeling a lot higher inflation, but according to the data, it's between 3 to 4%. So when the Federal Reserve Bank now works to raise interest rates, what does that do? Well, that makes consumption more expensive because remember, we live in a credit-based system, which means for the average person, I don't recommend you do this, I'm telling you what the average person does, the average person now has to pay more money to buy a car, the average person has to pay more money to rent their home, the average person has to pay more money to buy their groceries, the average person has to pay more money because they're financing all of these things. So if your debt costs go up, well, now you have to spend less because you can't buy as nice of a car because your car payments are gonna be more expensive because of the higher interest rates. And so because of these higher interest rates, people start to lower their consumption, they lower their demand for items, which helps cool the price growth of things. Again, they don't want the prices of things to fall, they want the prices of things to rise less quickly. And in addition to that, this is why the Federal Reserve Bank has kept such a tight eye on the unemployment rate because the Federal Reserve Bank has said time and time again that they want layoffs to rise. Now, they can't come out and say that we want unemployment to rise because that would be very politically incorrect. Instead, what they say is that they want to see a cooling of the labor market. Now, what does it mean to see a cooling of the labor market? A cooling of the labor market means you have higher unemployment, less people have jobs. If less people have jobs, they have less spending ability from their income. They also have less credit worthiness, which means they can qualify for less credit from the bank and they have less buying power. And now, if people have less spending ability, less people are going out and buying stuff, you have less demand for stuff out there, which slows down the economy. And this is that tightrope that the Federal Reserve Bank is trying to walk, because on one hand, they want to cool down inflation. We still have hot inflation today. And that's why now they're trying to decide when should we start cutting interest rates, because if you start cutting interest rates too soon, that can make this whole problem much worse. Because if mortgage rates fell to 3% tomorrow, everybody would start buying a home, Bidding wars would start all over again. Home prices would shoot up all over again. So the Federal Reserve Bank does not 
want to start cutting interest rates too soon. But at the same time, higher interest rates also cool down the economy. They cool down the economy because if you have to pay more money, pay more interest to buy things, less people are spending. Now today, yes, people are still spending like crazy because people can still qualify for debt. People can still qualify for credits. But if interest rates were lower, you bet the people will be spending even more aggressively. So this is the tightrope. But the Federal Reserve Bank understands that they have to manage interest rates in a way that's going to work to cool down inflation, but also not tip the United States into a major recession. Now, what is going to happen? Only time will tell. But this is that balancing act where you want to pay attention to what's happening. And this is where instead of trying to predict what's going to happen, instead of trying to freak out about what's happening, be prepared for anything. If we do see an economic downturn, have cash to protect you in case something happens to your company and have cash to capitalize on assets. Because if you see an economic downturn, that creates buying opportunities because asset prices might fall. If markets keep going up, we'll also keep investing your money that way we can take advantage of the upside. You want to be a financially savvy investor that can win when markets are up and when markets are down, but that requires you to have the financial education. And number two, be prepared, which means you don't want to be one of the people that's blindsided by what's happening, which is why it helps to pay attention to what's happening and understand what's happening in the markets when it's happening. And that's why I created Market Briefs as a free resource for you. And again, I have the link to Market Briefs down in the description below. Retailers like Peloton and Saks keep paying vendors late, signaling possible financial distress. This is a chart showing the percentage of SACS bills that are past due. And what you can see is that in October 2023, about 18.2% of SACS Fifth Avenue bills were past due. And then if you fast forward to February 2024, 